And we are live. It's Dr. Justin Marcajani here in the house. Today we're going to be chatting about bile and gallbladder function and how it connects to SIBO. We'll be breaking down the physiology, how it connects upstream to gut dysbiosis and or SIBO and what symptoms it may cause. And before we do, please smash that like button. It really helps the YouTube algorithm. Put your comments down below. Let me know if you have a gallbladder, if you have any gallbladder issues or what your experience with SIBO is. All right, let's dive in. So First off, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That's dysbiosis, more bad bacteria than good, primarily in the small intestine. Typically, you have bacteria migrating up from the colon into the small test, the small intestine, right? We have three parts of the small intestine, duodenum, jejunum, ileum. So we're going um, to that bottom part of the, the colon, right, the cecum, ileocecal, and it's going back to the ileum in the small intestine. And that does a couple of things. It's going to affect nutrient absorption. It's going to affect butyric acid. It's going to affect good, healthy probiotic balance in relationship to bad bacteria, right? Lactobacillus bifidobacter species in relationship to the bad stuff. Could be citrobacter, could be proteus, could be morganella, could be prevotella, could be pseudomonas, could be any of those dysbiotic bad bacteria that are typically found in SIBO. Now, SIBO is typically assessed and tested either with a... Um, endoscopy sample or typically an endoscopy sample or the mainstream, the easier non-invasive way is going to be a breath test. And usually it's going to be a lactulose breath test where it measures methane and hydrogen gases, you know, in a two hour time frame, because typically it takes from zero to two hours for it to make its way into the colon. So anything two hours or under 120 minutes or under, give us a pretty good window in SIBO, bad bacterial overgrowth. So methane, you know, greater than three or five or so is, you know, subclinically positive and anything greater than 15 on the hydrogen, 20 or total above is kind of the, the combo gig on that. And so really important to look at that and test that. We may also run bacterial tests like a GI map test. We'll put links down below that will actually test the bacteria that's typically found in SIBO. It won't tell us, hey, is that bacteria overgrown specifically in the small intestine? May not tell you that, but it will def definitely give you a window into the fact of is there a dysbiosis or not? Is there more bad bacteria, whether it's Citrobacter, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, etc., or not? So that's kind of how we look at it. We may also run organic acids that look at benzoate, hipparate, phenylacetate, indican, right? These are different markers that may come out in the urine from dysbiotic bacterial overgrowth. So really helpful to look there. Now, in regards to gallbladder function, why is the gallbladder so important to SIBO? Well, gallbladder spits out bile acids, and these bile acids actually have effects, uh, antimicrobial effects. So when you produce bile, think of it as like you just cook some bacon on, this, on the stove, right? And you got this layer of fat, and you're trying to wash it. You're putting water on it. What happens? That fat just sticks, but you put some nice Dawn soap on there. What happens? That fat comes right off. Well, guess what? That's what bile salt is in your intestines. It emulsifies that fat so you can break it down, put it into, into my, cells, my cells, and then absorb it and use it in your body when it comes to hormones, cell membrane, building blocks, maybe there's cholesterol mixed in for hormone building blocks. All of these things are really, really important. So bile helps with that fatty acid breakdown, which becomes building blocks for your cells, hormones, etc. It also is antimicrobial, so it makes it harder for bad bacteria to grow. So one of the big things we see in SIBO is there tends to be poor gallbladder function and or not enough bile being produced from that gallbladder, right? Bile is actually made by the liver, goes down the common hepatic duct into the bile duct, and it's concentrated in the gallbladder. So the gallbladder concentrates bile 10, 15x, and then it, it contracts and punctuates that release of bile when this hormone called cholecystokinin is made. And that hormone is primarily made when we eat proteins and fats, and also a big trigger for that is gonna be stomach acid. So having enough hydrochloric acid that brings the pH down. Remember, acid pH is lower, alkaline is higher, right? Greater than seven, alkaline, seven right in the middle is neutral. Greater, lower than seven is acid. So that nice low acidic pH, one and a half, two, that triggers that gallbladder to release. So if we're on a low fat diet, we're not gonna be releasing a lot of bile. So that bile can crystallize and form stones. And then when we do contract it, when we eat some junk food fat, it's like hugging a porcupine. We're gonna kinda get, we're gonna get pricked. We're gonna get inflamed, right? 
And so we want to make sure that one, that bile's always flowing so we're not creating crystals and stones. And that's also going to prevent us from hugging the porcupine, so to speak. But we're also making sure we have enough acidity in our stomach as well to trigger that gallbladder release. Now, acidity in the stomach is going to happen with good parasympathetic nervous tone. So if our adrenals aren't, aren't overactive, if we're not consuming food allergens, gluten, refined dairy, lots of refined um, processed sugar or trans fat, that's going to keep our body more in a parasympathetic state, and that's going to help us with our stomach acid production. And that stomach acid production is the next domino that triggers the CCK, which then is going to trigger the gallbladder to release. And also, the pancreas produces lipase that also helps with the gallbladder as well. Lipase helps break down fat enzymatically. Bile is more of that big emulsifier, right? The Dawn soap on that bacon pan analogy I just gave you. So it's going to help break down the fats. It's going to provide an antimicrobial environment. Um, and then when we have less bad bacteria, we have more good bacteria there. Good bacteria actually produces more acids, right? Acidophilus means acid loving. So we produce more acids. Those acids then also create more butyric acid, which is the major fat in butter and butyric acid feeds good bacteria and it makes it harder for bad bacteria to grow. When we have more good bacteria, we have more endogenous B vitamin production, endogenous vitamin K production. Good bacteria eats poop and poops nutrients. Bad bacteria eats nutrients and poops more poop. Essentially, bad bacteria adds more toxic load to your intestinal tract. And then if we have poor motility, we're going to potentially reabsorb a lot of those toxins that can create more gut stress. More gut stress can open up those tight junctions and then those undigested bacteria particles or stool particles can get into the bloodstream and create more immune stress. Leaky gut, leaky brain. Leaky brain, brain fog, anxiety, depression, mood issues, cognitive issues, etc. So you can see how poor digestion, gut issues, that gallbladder imbalance can start to create motility imbalances, constipation or extreme diarrhea, and that can create a whole host of issues in regards to absorption. All right, hope that makes sense and helps out, y'all. So in general, upstream acid, upstream enzyme, that triggers gallbladder, healthy gallbladder in function, and then the, the gallbladder connection to the SIBO is very, very important. It's a big part Bile function and hydrochloric acid are a big connection to why we may have SIBO. All right, hope that helps y'all. Any other questions, feel free and chime in. Let me see if I have any here to, to hit up with off the bat. And so just to kind of recap, right, testing. Testing is important. Breath testing, stool testing, organic acid testing. These are going to be the big things that we want to look at to dive in deeper and how to diagnose it. So most people are like, well, how do I know if I have it? The tests are going to be the, the, the big things that you want to look at. Okay, excellent. Let me continue to roll through questions. Okay, I want to keep topics that are related here. Uh, they gave me triple therapy for H. pylori. So let's go over that. So H. pylori is a common infection that people with SIBO may have. Now, most people with SIBO, it could just be SIBO, but others, it could be a fungal overgrowth with SIBO. It could be an H. pylori infection with SIBO. It could be H. pylori blasto and SIBO. So if we have H. pylori, the common therapy is triple therapy, which is going to be either some type of PPI, proton pump inhibitor, some type of clarith clarithromycin or amoxicillin or both, and then maybe bismuth is common as well. And typically they recommend an acid blocker to help the antibiotics work better. And then usually they're using two antibiotics or they may rotate a bismuth in or maybe even a tetracycline or doxy as well. But those are the big two. So in general, you want to make sure you rule out H. pylori. I always recommend the natural treatment to address that. We use different herbs, whether it's mastic, berberine, uh, clove, wild indigo, different herbs that I've had a great success rate. We don't have all the side effects um, antibiotics can create a lot of oxidative stress, especially if you're using fluoroquinolones, which are known to cause DNA damage, mitochondrial damage, not good. What's the best way to clear detoxification pathways? First thing is stop clogging it with toxins. Look at your water, look at your food, uh, look at sleep, look at movement. Those are the easiest first four. So organic, make sure most of your drinks are going to be either mineral water or, or good, clean, filtered water. Eat organic. And then, of course, making sure you're moving and you're pooping every day and peeing. That, that's really good. How to improve gut motility. So first thing is make sure you're digesting your food well. So you're chewing it. You're eating really good foods that aren't inflammatory and you have enough stomach acid and enzymes. And then ideally, make sure your foods are moving through your body within 24 hours or so. 
So you can eat some beets and see if your stool gets red, and that'll tell you your transit time. You can do some charcoal, look for your stool to get black. That'll tell you your transit time. These are all helpful things to look at to assess how fast things are moving. Just curious if you know if actual stomach biopsies would reveal other parasites than H. pylori. The big thing with a gastric biopsy is you're going to be looking at more than likely some kind of a cancer. You'll be looking at H. pylori. Um, and you'd be looking at maybe some kind of a gastritis. Those would be the big things I think you'd be looking at. Of course, you can go up in the esophagus and look at Barrett's esophagus where the tissue starts going. I think it starts turning more columnar versus squamous. Essentially, it gets thicker. Think of it as like a callus. And then um, they may do like an upstream breath test where they give you glucose instead of the giving you lactulose to look at more upstream bacterial overgrowth issues with the stomach. Okay, excellent. Just curious if you know, uh, okay, can HCL supplements be used with H. pylori or do HCL supplements aggravate the H. pylori infection? Great question. It depends upon how inflamed your gut is. If you can add in some lemon juice and some and some HCL and it doesn't inflame your gut, then you're more than likely okay. If you know you have active ulcers, you got to be careful. Work with a functional medicine doctor. Um, it also depends upon how good your diet is because a lot of times people's gut issues are because of the food is either too inflammatory or not cooked well enough. So it really just depends. After using multiple natural antibiotics in past and ignorance and then get acute stomach infections, again, using natural antimicrobial, just rely on multiple probiotics or combine them both. So I think what I'm seeing here is you're having issues with the natural antibiotics. Is that what you're saying? I'm trying to understand that. So uh, in general, I would I would make sure that you are utilizing as much of the natural stuff as possible, but you have to follow the six R's. So if you're having a problem with yourself, work with a good functional medicine doctor like Evan or myself, remove the bad foods, replace the enzymes, acid, repair the gut lining and the hormones, remove the infections, re-inoculate, repopulate, retest. And if you have a partner and there's H. pylori, you got to fix it because it's easily spread. So just kissing or sharing silverware, even non-sexual things that like a roommate may do, like sharing a drink or whatever, not washing um, a fork in between cleaning, right? That could easily spread stuff. So we got to keep an eye on that. How can one negate DNA damage or mitochondrial damage? Uh, first thing is don't use antibiotics or use them only if necessary. Use natural things first. Um, you can do things like vitamin C. You can do things like glutathione. You can do natural antioxidants to kind of help buffer that damage as well. Uh, if you eat gluten while pregnant when you are gluten sensitive, can it harm the growing baby's teeth? Well, I wouldn't be worried about the teeth per se, but could it harm their nervous system or trigger autoimmunity in them? It's possible. It really depends upon how sensitive you are and how much you're exposing the baby to it. So think about it. Most women kind of have this mindset when they're pregnant. It's a free-for-all and they can just succumb to any craving they're having. I look at it as like, no, you're Floyd Mayweather. You got to fight in nine months. You got to get ready for. So it's like kind of, you got to have this training mindset when you get pregnant. Oh, I'm going to eat really good. You may increase your carbs. You know, you may, you may not want to go 100% low carb. You may curtail your exercise a little bit, but you're going to be focused on eating really great food because it's like, I'm building a home, right? I'm going to, you know, the lumber yard. I want to get the best quality lumber to build my home. I want to get the best pipes. I want to get the best wiring. I want to get the best tile. So think of that as when you're growing a baby, it's like you're building a house. You're not going to go to the lumber yard and just choose the, the crappiest stuff, right? Well, if you're going to McDonald's or eating crappy food when you're pregnant, that's kind of the mindset. So shift the mindset as you're a prize fighter. Shift it as I'm focusing on high quality building blocks to build that baby. I right, hope that helps. Just curious if I would have to come off on the Prozole to use the type of testing you recommend. My GI doc said I would have to come off it um, to use conventional stool testing. It depends. Some of the genetic tests, yes, um, you may be able to use it. Some of the stool culture tests, you probably would have to come off it. But it depends on the test. I think the GI map, you could still be on it. But a conventional stool test, you'd have to be off it for a week or two for sure. All right, hope that helps y'all. All right, what kind of beginning liver kidney cleansing do you recommend? Already pretty low carb and introducing herbs like dandelion, celery. So yeah, for liver, dandelion, fringe tree, celery, ginger tea is wonderful for kidney. Um, astragalus is great. Cordyceps is great. Uh, good potassium is great. All those are really good. Would you recommend the specific carbohydrate diet or the low FODMAP diet to treat SIBO? Yeah, 
a paleo low FODMAP could be a really good starting point. Some have to be more specific above and beyond that. All right, I'll be back later on today, y'all. Hope you enjoyed today's content. Give me a share. Post it to your social media. It really helps. Sharing is caring. Comments to justinhealth.com slash iTunes really helps y'all giving that feedback and sharing it and getting the information out. You guys have a phenomenal day. Take care.